Okay, everyone out there, thank you for joining us today. Um, we are going to talk about geopolitics and investing. So first, some quick logistics. To find this paper that we're going to speak about, here's the web address up here. Go to our website. You can download it. It's in a PDF. This is what it looks like. Uh, we have been getting in the reviews, and we actually received a 97% score on Rotten Tomatoes, which is really quite good from what I understand. Um, so it's being very well received. We really encourage you to read it. Uh, initial reviews include, it was so good by Miles. And uh, this is even interesting for normal people to read, uh, not just nerds, I mean, which was a comment helpfully submitted by Daniela, our COO. So I'm gonna hand it over to Jacob. He's gonna do the initial uh, presentation, and then I'm going to jump in and speak more about how we use geopolitics with investing together. Uh, and then at the end, we'll speak about uh, how are we actually implementing this? How can you work with us? What are the next steps? So Jacob, um, why don't you just introduce yourself for anyone who doesn't know, and then we can get into it. Sounds great. Um... So I'm Jacob Shapiro. I'm the director of geopolitical analysis at CI. I also, uh, you know, work with some companies directly doing supply chain risk and things like that at my small boutique consulting firm, Perch Perspectives. Um, and it's been really exciting to unveil this this white paper with Rob and and to make geopolitics in this sense a little bit more real. It can be a little abstract and, and highfalutin, I think, when it's out there and you're just thinking about all these different things, but. Um, I actually really like the discipline of markets because the markets are going to tell you whether a thesis you have is right or wrong. You don't sort of have to argue about it uh, one way or another. Um, I'm sort of in a catch-22. I don't, I don't want to assume that everybody has actually made it through the probably you know, too long uh, report that we put out, but I also don't want, to, um, I don't want to rehash things if you have actually made your way through it. So I'll try and just kind of go through the the highlights from a geopolitical perspective that I want to make sure you know before handing over to Rob, and then hopefully having a more interesting conversation about two examples of us using geopolitics right now in an investment basis. Um, in terms of what geopolitics is, um, I was just actually arguing with a couple of former colleagues of mine on our shared geopolitical Slack channel this week. Uh, where one of them said, does geopolitics actually do anything? I've been doing this for like 10 years and I feel like it actually gets everything wrong. Um, and I responded to him by saying, um, it only gets everything wrong if it's the only tool in your toolbox. I mean, imagine you were showing up to fix a house or something or repair a faucet and you only had a hammer in your toolbox, you probably wouldn't be able to fix the faucet. I sort of think of geopolitics as the same way. It's one tool in your toolkit and the tool or the metaphor that I've been able to come up with is that geopolitics is a compass. It's going to point you in the right direction. If you only use geopolitics, if you only think about these things, you're probably going to get some things wrong. And we can talk a little bit about how that works. Um, another thing to say about geopolitics, though, is that it's a tool. It's also a framework for how to understand what is happening in the world. It is not a magic eight ball. It is not some esoteric, mystical force that exists in the world and bends to all things. It's really actually a dry sort of social science way of understanding what is going on in the world. And as a method, it was developed in the 1890s and early 1900s. Now, in the white paper, we talk a lot about Rudolf Chelen, who is this Swedish guy who came up with the phrase geopolitics in the first place. Um, I was actually, uh, we were looking at um, data from our podcast today and found that apparently we get 75 to 100 downloads per episode in Sweden for the podcast, which is remarkable to me. That's really cool. Um, but anyway, so Chalen's work is not particularly well known because it ha actually hasn't really been translated into English. And I think people have forgotten that he was really the person who started geopolitics as a framework. And he was dealing with a world where um, these multi-ethnic empires were collapsing where kings were giving way to democratic governments, where the nation state was emerging and taking advantage of all this technology to become the real constituent block um, of international politics. And this framework that he developed was to try and understand what was going on. And he wasn't the only one. Um, Roger Baker, who was actually the person who trained me back at Stratford back in the day, read the white paper and wrote me a note just yesterday saying, 
it's funny that you focused on Chelan. I consider myself much more a disciple of Mackinder. Mackinder is probably a name that if you're a geopolitical nerd, you probably have a better chance of having heard. And he talked about how Mackinder was less deterministic and less sort of biological than Chelan was. And I think that's true. The point though, is that there were a bunch of thinkers around this time who were trying to understand how nation states were gonna behave in this new international environment. And that's the other thing I think it's important to talk about here. Um, it was a multipolar world in the 1890s and 1900s. That's a fancy way of saying you had a bunch of different powers um, that were vying for global supremacy or for survival or trying to gain independence. So the British Empire was the top dog, but it was fairly evident that the British Empire was going into decline. It was fairly evident that Germany was rising as a power that was going to compete with Britain in the long term. Japan was a rising power at the time. It had just kicked Russia's butt in a war. Um, there's some very interesting similarities, I think, between what Putin has done in Ukraine now and what Russia did in picking a fight with Japan in the early 1900s. So it was this era of rising and falling great powers. And I think that sort of macro environment is what geopolitics was designed to explain. Now, you went from a multipolar era after World War World Wars I and II to a bipolar era. That's the Cold War with the United States and Soviet Union duking it out. And then when the Soviet Union collapses, you get the unipolar moment. And that's where the United States emerges as the dominant power. And with no real challengers to the United States, you get this era of globalization. And you get this sort of strange 30 year hiatus where geopolitics is really, it's not that geopolitics doesn't work as much, it's just that you don't need to take that tool out of the toolkit that much. The United States was the most important power in the world. Everybody was kind of going in lockstep with what the United States wanted, whether it was China, whether it was Germany, even Russia, everything was about, we all want to have more trade. We all want to have lean supply chains. We all want to do, we all want to have iPods and iPhones and listen to American pop music. And that was what happened for approximately 30 years. And the argument that we're making here is that we're returning to that multipolar type era, that the United States is playing the same role as the British Empire in the early 1900s. China is Germany in this metaphor. Russia is almost doing a complete recap recapitulation of the things that it did. You also have an even more varied map though. You have countries like Turkey, like Brazil, like India, where it's not written in stone. Some of the decisions that they make going forward are gonna define um, whether they're able to rise or whether they're able to fall apart or, or sort of all those things in between. In terms of geopolitics as a discipline, there's really two things that I would emphasize in thinking about it. The first, and it sh I think it shares a lot in common with sort of macro fundamental analysis. The first thing that geopolitics wants to do is it wants to identify some objective things that you can really sink your teeth into. So one thing that, that I always do when I'm approaching a country is I need to understand what a country's imperatives are. An imperative is just a fancy way of saying, what does a country need in order need to do in order to survive? Rob's pulled up a map here of the Northern European plain, which I like to call the invasion superhighway of Europe. If we're trying to apply imperative analysis to this map right now, Russia is a really great example. Russia sitting there on the Northern European plain. You can basically drive a tank all the way from Normandy straight to Moscow. If you're Russia, no matter whether you're Putin or Naval, it doesn't matter who's in office. You're gonna try and push as far as you can on the Northern European plain to try and protect yourself and give yourself strategic depth. That's a Russian um, national security imperative. Germany and some of those powers in Europe also have the same imperative. That's why you get so many conflicts around Eastern Europe and why Eastern Europe has been a battleground between Russia and Germany and, these, and France and these European powers for literally centuries. Um, the second part of geopolitics or fundamental geopolitical analysis is constraints. So what is a country incapable of doing? I don't think Rob has a map of this in there, but a really good example of constraints is the ongoing conversation about China and Taiwan. China absolutely has an imperative to try and conquer Taiwan. It can't do it. They literally just started building amphibious landing craft to actually undertake that sort of invasion a couple of years ago. Call me when they have ships to do it. And then we can talk about, oh, are the Chinese gonna do it? What is that gonna look like? How is it gonna look like? But if you have a firm idea of what a country's constraints are, it doesn't matter what the imperatives are. It's that old Sherlock Holmes line, if you can eliminate um, the impossible, whatever remains, is probably going to be the truth. That's what constraint-based analysis or looking at it from that point of view works with. So those are sort of the fundamentals. But one of the reasons I like Chilen and one of the reasons we focused on him is that not all countries are rational and not all countries do things that are in their best interest. 
Um, a lot of what we're, it's it, this geopolitics is sort of a social science in the sense that it wants to define those objective forces, but it also admits that we're dealing with human beings here and that human beings do things out of fear or out of love or out of different types of emotions or out of even being wrong, even analyzing a situation in an incorrect way. Look at the Russia-Ukraine war today. The reason Russia invaded Ukraine was because it thought it was going to take over Kyiv. They were wrong. That was a st strategic miscalculation. So if you're the most brilliant geopolitical analyst in the world, and you could have predicted um, that, of course, Russia was never in the long term going to win a war in Ukraine, you still would have gotten the prediction wrong. That's actually one of the reasons I think I was so off on Russia's intentions in Ukraine, because I got blinded by what I thought Russia should do from an objective perspective and didn't spend enough time hacking into, OK, but what does Putin think? What is the Russian government feeling right now? What is it afraid of? And what is it going to do that maybe doesn't seem rational to me in my current context, but which is going to make sense in their geopolitical context? And that's one of the reasons I like Chilen so much, and I come back to it, because he treats nation states in his model like they are organisms. So it's not always about what's in your best interest. Sometimes it's just about what you have to do to survive. What resources do you have to secure in order for you to, to develop in certain ways? I um, mean, it can paint a picture of the world that is sometimes stark and depressing, but usually it gives you a more accurate um, idea of what's going to happen next. Um, before I hand it over to Rob, and then before we get down into some of the sort of nitty gritty brass tacks, um, if Rob can go to that global spheres of influence uh, map, this was a map that I um, made in 2019. Yeah, because I, I gave this presentation in Canada in 2019 that it was part of. And this was my sort of very, very, um, I don't want to say high confidence. This is what I sort of imagined what um, global spheres of influence might look like um, in the world up to 2040. We were giving a presentation to some um, Chilean executives just a couple weeks ago. And um, one of the Chilean executives asked me, well, wait, I don't understand why are India and Brazil in gray? The reason they're in gray is because I consider them wild cards. I don't have a really good sense of exactly what sphere of influence they're going to be in in 2040. They are both nation states that might have their own spheres of influence in 2040. And again, this map is, is a couple years old, but it is a thought exercise for thinking about what is a multipolar world going to look like going forward. You're going to have a U.S. dominated sphere of influence. Um, the lighter blue color, which here is the Trans-Pacific Partnership, but that's probably not a perfect thing. But the point of that category is to think there's probably going to be an association of middle powers that don't want to be confined to any one block and that will try and actually link themselves even more closely um, so that they can project more strength or have more economic growth. So you'll have these little um, bubbles of increased globalization in a world that overall is actually becoming less globalized. Um, you can see there that the European Union with a Franco-German arm is, is called out. You've got a Chinese sphere of influence and then a Turkish sphere of influence. I won't step on the Turkey conversation because that's going to be one of our examples later. So I'm not saying this map is exactly right, but this sort of map, I am sure we're going to have some version of this in 2040 when we're thinking about what the global balance of power looks like. And when we're thinking about everything from where companies are going to build supply chains, how to make investment decisions, even where you want to go on vacation, understanding all the different sort of political forces that are behind this map, how that's going to change, how things are going to evolve over time. Um, I think that's just critical for, for getting an edge and understanding what is happening next. Um, and it really is a departure from that unipolar moment where everybody was pulling in the same direction. Everybody wanted to be in the WTO. Everybody wanted to join the UN. That's not the kind of map that I think we're going to look at going forward. So that's kind of my rundown of the most important bits of the white paper with a few extra things sprinkled in from some of the feedback we've already gotten already. Rob, maybe I'll turn it over to you and talk about how you translate that in, into sort of an investment thesis and how you've been using that on the investment side. Yeah, sure. So um, I think as you described it, Jacob, we're moving from a world where uh, the United States ran the world in many ways. And this is the you know, exemplary image from the 1990s, uh, probably the peak of US institutional power relative to everyone else. And um, that's changed. So this is a, a breakout of uh, 45 different country ETFs. And the thing that's striking about this is the dispersion in returns so this is showing you visually, and this is going back uh, seven or eight years, 
if you were to pick the winning countries and uh, versus the losing countries, what is your return potential? What is your alpha potential in the parlance of, of uh, investments? And it's shockingly large. On average, the difference between the best returning ETF and the worst performing country ETF is 70 percentage points. Um, so you're already starting with a much larger and more varied opportunity set than most people understand. And this is going to become even wider in the coming years. And we're gonna speak about why that is. Uh, so this is where you wanna be fishing. This is where your thoughtful analysis and your thoughtful selection of the good versus the bad opportunities is going to bear fruit. Um, I like this chart. This shows something that is also, I found surprising when we were doing the research for this. So this shows the opportunity set for stocks that are outside of the US versus stocks that are in the US. And there's a few things to note here. So first, the size of the bubbles uh, represents the amount of revenues that each of these is generating. So outside of the US, these are publicly traded stocks. This is not private markets. Uh, publicly traded companies are generating uh, more than twice the revenues of US traded companies. Uh, in terms of the sheer number of stocks, it's about five times as much. Um, so you have more companies to choose from. They're in aggregate uh, doing more business than the US companies are. And this is the really striking thing. This shows here on the horizontal axis, the valuation of US stocks versus non-US stocks. So we've just finished a generational bull market in the US. Uh, which appears to be starting to roll over. And we sit here at the end of that bull market and the price to sales ratio, the total value of the US uh, stock universe relative to the amount of revenues they're generating is over two and a half times. Um, whereas internationally we're less than one and a half times. So the foreign opportunity is more varied, it's larger and it's cheaper in aggregate. You know, put those three things together and you have a very attractive opportunity set to be going after. So here's a picture uh, of, of a scary time. And I think my purpose in putting this in here is to emphasize that the striking thing right now is you have this huge opportunity set. You have the environment that Jacob described where you're moving from a unipolar environment, a globalization environment, to one that is more multipolar and combative and competitive. And yet you're not experiencing this. We're not in the 1930s. We're in the Belle Epoque, as Jacob would say. Uh, this is a late 1800s sort of environment where you have rising powers that are jostling against each other, and yet they're not in open conflict. Uh, you're not seeing um, you know, major shutdowns of the economy, as you saw in the 1930s. In the 1930s, when the same thing happened, if you were a US-based investor, that's great. You're not doing anything. Um, Germany closed down its economy entirely. You couldn't, you couldn't get a, a, a dime through the capital account. There was nothing to do. And many, many countries were in the same situation. Um, compare that to today. These are just two articles from today that we just picked off. Here's President Xi Jinping saying, please, you know, we really want foreign capital, uh, come on in. Uh, here's an article uh, about Turkey, which many people view as one of the uh, bad guys of the global scene right now, um, saying that they're gonna provide special liquidity to foreign investors who just wanna come in and buy Turkish assets. These are not the hallmarks of a 1930s style environment. So in many ways, you're in a kind of sweet spot right now because you have this kind of dispersion happening. It's going to become more dispersed. You have a huge opportunity set that's built up over the decades, and yet you have openness, freedom of capital flows, the opportunity to take advantage of those uh, investment um, uh, 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 opportunities that emerge. So, why do you want to be thinking about uh, 
international investing. Well, as we just said, we just finished a massive bull market in the US and where are the growth opportunities going to be for the next 10 to 20 years? They're by definition going to be happening outside of US shores. So here, um, I like this chart. This shows the income per capita of the US going all the way back to 1800 versus the three truly great growth miracles that we've observed in our time. Uh, and that was Japan, South Korea, and China. And I don't have it here, but if you were to look at a picture of downtown Shanghai in 1990 and compare it to a picture of downtown Shanghai today, the sheer physical transformation that's occurred is incredible. This is the miracle, truly the miracle of our time. Um, the number of people, the amount of wealth that has been created, the amount of freedom that has been created to make choices with your life that uh, poverty uh, prevented you from doing before. This is where the big opportunities are. The U.S. is at the technological frontier where you're investing in the U.S. You're trying to figure out which technology is going to win, which, which business model is going to win, but the rising tide is not going to be lifting all the boats. Whereas uh, outside of the U.S. is where you have the opportunity to find these kinds of miracles now. And if you look outside of these countries, the vast majority of nations across, uh, across the world have not experienced this miracle. The gap between the U.S. and the poorest countries of the world has widened, not uh, closed over this period, which is shocking and sad, but it represents an enormous opportunity. So how does that opportunity manifest itself in day-to-day -day investing? Um, this chart shows the progression of interest rates in the three largest economic zones uh, in the world. The black line is the US, the green line is Europe, the red line is China. And the point that we're making here is prior to 2008, 2010, these three lines moved in a fairly close lockstep. So economic cycles were synchronized, interest rate cycles were synchronized. Uh, you didn't have to worry too much about where you were exposed geographically. Everything was moving together. The tide was raising and lowering all the boats. Um, since 2010 or 2012, this has been a giant mess. This is like a plate of spaghetti with the lines going in all different directions. So uh, if you were to look today, China is mired in a deep recession. Europe is uh, has been uh, in a recession and is starting to try to come out of it. And the US has been on fire and is moving into a recession. So the, the lockstep sort of synchronized macro cycles that we saw in the past are completely out of whack. And a lot of that is due to policy, it's due to supply chains, it's due to COVID restrictions, and none of these things are going away. So um, Jacob and I just wanted to bring up a tangible concrete example of how do we take this into account in our day to day. So we pulled an example of something that the team was looking at just today. And we don't have a strong view on this. Uh, this is something that we're exploring. So the, here's the Hong Kong dollar. Um, and Jacob, maybe do you want to give a little background because there's sort of an interesting historical story to how this came about. And, and you know, I, I included a picture of Margaret Thatcher just for you. So I don't want to waste it. No, I, I've been thinking about the Hong Kong dollar for most of the day. Um, and I mean, for those who don't know, the Hong Kong dollar is pegged to the value of the US dollar. Um, and it's been pegged there since 1983. And the reason there's a peg between the Hong Kong dollar and the US dollar is because 1983 was when that picture with Deng Xiaoping and Lady Margaret Thatcher I don't know if that's actually in 83, but they met in 1983. And according to Thatcher's memoirs, so we have to take it with a little bit of grain of salt, she was meeting with Deng and said, I would like to renew the 99-year British lease on Hong Kong that is up at the end of the century. And Deng Xiaoping said something along the lines of here, I actually even wrote down the quote because of how stark it was. Um, we could walk back into Hong Kong and take it later today if we wanted to. So that's the message that Thatcher gets out of that. And whether or not Deng actually said that, um, the market felt that tension between the British government and between the Chinese government. 
And the Hong Kong dollar basically lost almost half of its value in a period of a couple months as Sino-British negotiations over Hong Kong went really badly. And so Hong Kong decides to peg the Hong Kong dollar to the US dollar to stop the bleeding. Uh, they needed to stabilize their currency. And in a sense, what they did was they gave up some of their monetary sovereignty for stability because they wanted to stabilize the investment climate and have foreign investors come in. Now, literally the next year after you stabilize it and after Britain eventually agrees that they're going to hand over Hong Kong um, to the Chinese at the end of the century, uh, China really starts its opening up package. They really go in on globalization full throttle. So a year after the, or even six months after that peg happens, China announces 14 different cities that are going to become special economic zones where you can, you're going to build ports and you're going to be able to export things. And at the same time, a lot of the manufacturing that was going to happen in Hong Kong moves to the Chinese mainland. And it moves there because there's a lot of cheap labor and cheap land in China, but also because that Hong Kong dollar peg drives up the price of property and drives up wages and a lot of different things in Hong Kong itself. So you get this symbiotic relationship where the world gets access to China via Hong Kong in a way that feels stable and secure. Hong Kong gets to enjoy all the benefits of becoming a financial center and basically remakes itself from a small manufacturing export oriented hub to a service financial hub between China and the rest of the world. And China gets this gateway, gets all this foreign capital to come through Hong Kong, but also gets to take all this manufacturing capacity and export over a long period of time. That's why the Hong Kong dollar and the US dollar is pegged. And you might already be, be realizing the point I'm gonna make here is that none of those geopolitical forces are true anymore. Absolutely zero of them are basically true anymore. Um, the United States, well, I should say China has basically effectively ended the two country, one systems policy. Um, there, there were a lot of small developments there, but the main one was the, the passage of the national security law in 2020. Um, China's been asserting more authority over Hong Kong. So not letting it exist is its own separate thing because it wants, it doesn't want the middleman anymore. And the United States has been exactly the same. The Trump administration revoked a lot of Hong Kong's special status um, by basically saying, look, uh, we don't want to give um, exports out of Hong Kong any preferential tariff treatment or any of these other special things in US law because it's basically part of China, which is ironically what China wanted the United States to say in the first place. So you have this situation where really the only thing keeping the, the Hong Kong dollar peg right now is inertia. It would be really, really hard to shift that system to something else. The renminbi is not ready and not sort of from a global circulation standpoint, ready to take over. Um, Hong Kong can't really go to a free floating exchange because that would actually create too much instability and probably decrease um, trade or investment or interest and things like that. So you're in this situation where the geopolitical fundamentals are changing, um, and and yet the the sort of the the dollar peg is probably going to stay there. And then the last thing, and Rob, you might want to talk a little bit more about this, but this goes to the synchronicity argument that you were making. One of the reasons that this is so difficult and why Hong Kong is really struggling right now is because. Hong Kong's interest rates are going up as the Fed also raises interest rates because of that peg, that lack of monetary sovereignty. And that's not what Hong Kong should be doing. Hong Kong, like the rest of China, because Hong Kong is now more similar to China than it perhaps was in the past from an economic perspective because of those linkages that have emerged in the last um, 20 years. Um, so Hong Kong is basically tightening in a recession while Shanghai and China have been lowering their interest rates uh, and trying to loosen monetary policy, which is in, in sort of contradiction with what's going on in the United States. Now you can make an optimistic um, argument that maybe Hong Kong is turning the corner here in the last month or two, the PMI has been up, there's some sort of initial indicators that maybe Hong Kong is turning an economic corner, so maybe it won't be as bad, but you are getting the signal where what's good for China and what's good for Hong Kong is not what Hong Kong is doing because it is tied to the US Fed. And that is not something that China or even Hong Kong itself probably wants in the long term. So there's a lot of underlying weaknesses in those fundamentals. It's probably not gonna switch overnight, um, but I think that's one of the reasons we're looking at it so closely because when that does shift, it'll be the same sort of shift with Thatcher and Deng Xiaoping. It'll happen overnight, it'll be very quick and it'll be a 50% or 100%, it'll be a very large move when it actually does kind of happen. Yeah, and we um, just pulled this out from 
today's discussion, as we said, we don't have any recommendations. We're not doing anything around this, but you need to know this if you're going to be exposed to any, I mean, the Chinese and Hong Kong indices are 30% of the emerging market index. If you own an index fund, that's an international fund, you are exposed to this in a major way. Um, and I think it's interesting to see how these geopolitical tectonic plates are shifting underneath. And not too many people are paying attention to this. Um, so that's one example of applying geopolitical analysis and geopolitical thought to um, an actual application in the investment world. And that's how we work together with Jacob um, at CI. You know, we have the investment team, Jacob and, and, and you know, the people that work with him lay out sort of the, the underlying fundamental uh, ground, groundwork. You know, what, is the, what are the incentives here? What are policymakers like, likely to do? And then you can take that and explore um, more deeply the different manifestations of that. So let's move on to the Turkey example, Jacob. Then do you want to just explain the, um, the sandstorm gold element? Because I think when people think of geopolitics, they often assume it's all very high level macro stuff. And that's not necessarily the case. No, you have to have the forest for the trees. And we sort of backed into our thesis on Turkey, as you said, from a very, very specific standpoint. So we were looking at a company, Sandstorm Gold, um, which is a gold, they're not a miner, they're a, a streamer, right, Rob? That's the, the right way to describe what they're doing. Yeah. Um, and one of their biggest assets uh, was gonna be in Turkey. And there were some, pro some local protests around their mine, concerns about environmental considerations or not, I mean, I forget the exact concerns or whatever. But the CI investment team was concerned about, well, a lot of this stock's value is wrapped up in this really um, large gold mine in Turkey. And if they're going to suddenly lose access to this, this is not a stock we probably want to be exposed to. So I had to do some very, very targeted research about what does the Turkish constitution say about who owns gold within Turkey and what is the prospects of Erdogan changing the rules around gold mining in Turkey while he changes the rest of the constitution. Um, none of the kind of really high level stuff that I think draws people to geopolitics, but in this case, really came down to whether we were going to make that investment or not. Um, and in the end, we decided that actually the Turkish government is probably not going to change those rules and that the, the mining situation, the regulatory situation around gold mining um, in Turkey was not going to affect um, our position there. And so we decided to go into it. But um, a couple of weeks later, it was sort of around that same time that we were, that we were doing research on the stock idea. Um, that Erdogan fired his finance minister and his Turkish central bank governor and the Turkish lira did one of its nosedives that it's been doing fairly often here in the last two to three years. Um, and I decided to write this piece about the Turkish lira and why we should probably go short the lira because I was trying to sound really intelligent and try and sort of apply things sort of outside of the realm of my expertise. And I gave the report to Rob and the investment team and they said, this is great. Uh, we think Turkey might be a long opportunity. We think this might be a time to go long Turkish equities. And for me, that was actually a big learning moment because um, what, what we had discovered about Turkey was not necessarily that the situation wasn't negative. There's a lot of crazy stuff happening in Turkey, things that are not particularly good. Um, Rob put the photo up of the Hitler youth. I'm not going to compare Erdogan to Hitler or Turkey to Nazi Germany, but I will say of all the countries in the world right now, Turkey is the one that has the most overtones of Nazi Germany. You've got an emerging nation state trying to reclaim an empire that it feels like it lost at one point, a lot of territory that they feel like they lost, that they need in order to secure their own living space. I mean, there's sort of a lot of um, disturbing analogs between Turkey and between some of those European nation states in the 1930s and 1940s. But, but aside from all those sort of domestic political problems, though, there is a macro context that is really, really bullish for Turkey. Um, Turkey, because of its geography, generally benefits from multipolar environments. So the reason um, that um, Turkey really exists in the first place, it's around the city of Istanbul, which is the, the, the city sits on the Bosporus, which is the link between the Black Sea and the Mediterranean Sea. You can sort of barely see it there in the map that Rob has 
um, on the screen right now. It's that little tiny point all the way up in the, in the left corner of Turkey linking the Black Sea and the Mediterranean Sea. And the whole reason the Ottoman Empire emerged, the whole reason that Rome moved its capital to Constantinople and existed for another thousand years as a Byzantine Empire rather than the Roman Empire was because in a multipolar environment, it actually pays um, to have secure trade routes and to have places that are more secure than everyone else. And what first the Romans and then the Ottomans were able to do were, were they were able to translate Istanbul or Constantinople or Byzantium, it's had a number of different names over the years, over the centuries, they were able to translate that into basically being the trade hub between East and West. So think about what Hong Kong, we just talked about Hong Kong, um, think about what Hong Kong has done except on a massive scale. So when you get into a multipolar environment where it's, it's not just going to be globalization free for all, where you're going to need areas where you want security, where a government can guarantee, hey, if you cross my land, as long as you pay these taxes, everything's going to go fine. And we're going to make sure that none of these um, outside actors are going to affect your trade routes. That's the sort of thing that Turkey was able to capitalize on long term and build an empire out of. And I think that's one of the things we're seeing in Turkey today. The other thing that this map um, sort of implies to you is that look at all those countries that Turkey is surrounded into the to the south and to the southeast and the Middle East. None of these countries can hold a candle to Turkey as an economic power, specifically as an industrial power and as a manufacturing power. Um, Israel is maybe the only one we should talk about at all because they have a fairly innovative economy, but they're tiny. It, there's a reason it's the startup nation and it's all about tech and software this and mobile eye that. Um, Turkey is a major country with a large population, which is producing lots of different things, which wants to sell into a lot of different markets, which can really serve as the connective tissue between Europe and between the Black Sea and even between um, China and the rest of Europe. Uh, the China's Silk Road policy uh, is, is meant to evoke the, you know, the original Silk Road from you know, the Roman Empire days. And if you look at a map of the Silk Road, I don't think we put one in here, but the Silk Road also looks like spaghetti a little bit, except all roads lead to Istanbul. And that's true in the Chinese map too. If you're going to actually connect Eurasia and do some of the things that both China and Europe are interested in for very different reasons, you're going to have to go through Istanbul in the first place. So even though Turkey might be a very unstable place in the moment right now. And even though Erdogan is doing some strange things with the Turkish lira because he wants to de-dollarize, those macro fundamentals are incredibly bullish for Turkey. And in some ways, it doesn't really matter who's in charge of Turkey. Turkey, just by virtue of where it is, what its power is like relative to other countries, it's going to do, do, it's going to do really well in this multipolar macro environment. And so we sort of stumbled into that and said, okay, these moments where people are freaking out about today's politics or because they feel like, oh, I don't like this Erdogan guy, so I'm going to you know, ignore Turkey because I think this is a terrible author authoritarian regime. Those are actually opportunities to get an option on that larger opportunity, which is Turkey really returning to the role that it's played for over millennia, where you have millennia of data showing Turkey actually does really well in these types of environments. I think that's a good example of using geopolitics because as you've described it in the past, Jacob, geopolitics is really the analysis of power. And I think that's something that gets very easily overlooked. Um, we read more than anybody, um, you know, Wall Street research and banks and, uh, you know, all of the institutional stuff that's produced for people like us. And you don't see those sorts of analyses at all. You see analyses of monetary policy and politics, but not power, the fundamentals of power, um, you know, shorter term issues, things that a trained economist might be looking for, but not something that someone with a true geopolitical background would be able to identify and wrap their hands around. Um, and that I think constitutes a major edge and just to elaborate on the Turkey example, we came into this, and if you were to compare Turkey to these other nations, so right now the Istanbul index on a valuation standpoint trades around here, around 0 0.6 times sales, which is awfully cheap, even if you take inflation into account and all of the sort of distortions from that, 
that's very, very cheap, even relative to where Turkey has historically traded. It's rock bottom. And Turkey's had inflation problems with only a brief respite for pretty much the last 75 years. So you're in this case, we were heading into this examining this opportunity that was clearly very deeply out of favor because of these short-term issues, because of politics, um, because of the way that most investors think about these things. And um, this was right around here. And, and we entered this position uh, last Thanksgiving. And at that point, that was when there was just a cacophony of bad news around Turkey. And this was when Jacob was saying, you know, you should short the lira, things are terrible. Um, and, and we said, well, no, you know, tell us about the real fundamentals because something is brewing here. Sentiment is terrible. The news flow is terrible. And yet the, this is the Turkish index, the ETF in dollar terms. And yet the, the Turkish index can't make new lows. You know, so, so what is in the price here? What is the risk reward of this investment opportunity? And that led us to taking a position. And, and you can see this is the performance of Turkey in absolute terms here and in relative terms uh, versus the S&P. It's early days and we're not patting ourselves on the back, but this is how we think. Um, this is a, what appears to be a long-term opportunity. And a, this was a tactical um, occasion to get your foot in there and start building that position and realize over five, 10, 15 years, what is the um, outcome of that going to be as those underlying power structures that Jacob focuses on begin to emerge and you start seeing news about Turkish businesses building more capacity because they're uh, taking supply chains away from other areas that are more troubled or you know whatever that development may be. Um, and that's kind of how we approach these things over the longer term. Um, a quick discussion of what do we do for clients? How do we actually put this to work? I mentioned we took a position in Turkey. What does that mean? Um, really, it's a few things. So for individual clients, what we do is we put together a comprehensive investment strategy for them um, that includes uh, as the centerpiece of that strategy, what we call CI strategic wealth which is a, an asset allocation strategy that shifts significantly across countries, across asset classes, based on the kind of long-term risk reward oriented research that we do, both on a country by country basis, but also from a broader macro basis and, and bottom up as well. Um, this is something that we do for clients. We subsidize, uh, not subsidize, we supplement this with, um, bad choice of words, uh, with, specialist strategies. So we have a macro strategy that is a more focused version uh, of our top-down views, long, short, and can go into commodities and other things where we see opportunities. Uh, we have specialist equity strategies where we're doing very deep research, including geopolitical research um, on individual companies. That was the Sandstorm Gold example that we mentioned. Um, but really the CI strategic wealth is the wheel at the center of everything that we do. And if you're a uh, financial advisor, if you're an institutional investor who has clients of your own, uh, this is something that we make available to institutional clients um, uh, on the Schwab platform, on interactive book brokers. Uh, we're rolling out other platforms in the future where you can uh, uh, implement this for your clients in a way that would replace a, you know, uh, an MSCI global index, uh, an S&P 500 index, um, these sort of very passive, um, not very durable uh, strategies. Um, because we think that's just not gonna work anymore. Passive is not gonna cut it. Um, we're entering an environment where um, most likely we're going to experience a long period of uh, volatility and shock and the notion that bonds can just passively protect your portfolio has proven to be uh, very wrong this year and it's probably going to continue to be so in the future. Um, so an active, durable, and global approach 
is what we take with CI Strategic Wealth. So um, we'll move into Q&A. Uh, I don't want to go on and on about uh, our strategies too much. Uh, while we pause to collect questions, and you can click on the Q&A button uh, on the bottom of your screen if you'd like to submit a question. Uh, just a reminder, here are some ways that you can follow what we're doing. If you're interested in this topic, clearly you're here. If you're not already, I really recommend signing up um, to the Global Situation Report that Jacob writes every week. This is a weekly summary of everything going on in the world, uh, and most importantly, what it means and how to interpret it. So forget about trying to read The Economist magazine every week. No one gets through it. It's impossible. This is a 20-minute read where you can feel like you're up on everything. Um, Jacob is writing about things that almost no one else is paying attention to, emerging risks in Central Africa, um, cobalt, um, the sort of thing that you read it here and then it shows up on the front page of the Wall Street Journal eight months later because something has uh, ballooned into a major issue. Uh, so I really encourage you to take a look at that. And then our podcast, uh, Cognitive Dissidence, which you can find a link to that on the website. This is essentially uh, a verbal um, uh, uh, version of the SITBRIP where Jacob is interviewing specialists in certain subject areas every other week. And then every week he and I have a chit chat about what's happening in markets, what's happening in geopolitics, how we're combining them together. So if this sort of thing uh, interests you, you can hear more about it there. So let's move to Q&A. Uh, so easy question, will a copy of the slides be shared? The answer is yes. So um, we will distribute that afterwards. Um, just wait. So, um, so Jacob, uh, any surprises that you found? Um, that you weren't expecting working with investors for the first time coming from kind of the background that you come from? I mean, <laughs> surprises, I don't know. One of the stories I always tell about, like one of, one of the very first projects I did that was investment related, this is way back um, in one of my previous jobs, was, uh, and this was when before the Syrian civil war had really kicked off. Um, and uh, there was a, I forget exactly who the client was, it was some kind of institutional investment client. They wanted to talk to us about what was going on in Syria. Um, and I remember the senior analysts and I, we, we prepared this hour long presentation. It was gonna be this tag team thing where I was gonna do 10 minutes, he was gonna do 10 minutes and I was gonna come back in and then we were just gonna wow them and stuff like that. Um, and I remember um, I got about five minutes through sort of my introductory salvo and the guy went, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, please stop for a minute. Who is this Bashar Assad person that you keep talking about? And, I, we, and we, it wasn't a video call, it was a conference call. So we all kind of looked at each other in the room. Bashar Assad is the president of Syria. And for the rest of the hour, we were basically just answering questions that the dude could have Googled. Um, and I have found in general that that's the level of depth that people have about geopolitics and investing. Another good example, I had a prospective client that wanted to talk to me about Russia, Ukraine, uh, sort of a month before the war kicked off. And, you know, they said, all right, well, we're going to talk to the guy on our team who does all the geopolitics. And I got on the phone with him. I was like, so like, what's your experience? Like, what do you know about Russia and Ukraine? Like, what's your experience level there? And he was like, oh, I don't know. I just got assigned to this two days ago. So I just started reading The Economist and I'm trying to figure out what's going on. Um, I think for me, the, the I, I, like geopolitical nerds, I think we've, we've generally gotten intimidated by the investment community because of all the jargon and because, oh, what is an interest rate? What is this? What is that? There's a lot of jargon that makes you feel like it's actually hard to understand. Um, but in some ways, I think the emperor has no clothes. Um, and one of the things that uh, I've enjoyed most about working with CI is we're actually um, not just using geopolitics, but we're applying it very practically and we're going very, very deep on issues. And I just, I mean, I'm tooting our own horn a little bit here, but having been doing this now for over a decade and interacting with a lot of different clients in a lot of different areas, a lot of folks say they know geopolitics or think they're doing geopolitics, but all they're either they don't and they're just lying 
reports, they have some silly index and something flashes red. They think that's what's going on geopolitically. One of the points that this, this white paper really tries to make is that geopolitics isn't just, I mean it when I say it's not an eight ball. You don't shake the magic eight ball and it gives you an answer. It's a discipline. It's a thought process. So for with the Turkey example, we could be wrong about our bet on Turkey. If we are wrong on Turkey, we'll be the first ones to know because we've decided that's an opportunity that's really interesting. And we're monitoring it constantly. And we have all these different indicators now that we're really paying attention to, to tell us when to increase the position or things that would actually break the thesis. Um, so in that sense, and you asked me sort of what's exciting or what I've learned, the ability to do that, to apply geopolitics in a way that actually produces tangible results, that's a really exciting thing. And it's something that I don't think a lot of people are doing. The other difficult thing about geopolitics, and I think in some ways geopolitics and investing sort of have these um, similarities. Everybody thinks they're a geopolitical expert. Um, and they think that because they think if you read the front page of the Wall Street Journal, you kind of know what's going on in the world. And I hope in this paper and in some of the analysis that people feel um, or when they read along with me, sometimes I don't know the answer to questions, but I'm at least gonna bring you along and show you the depth of research that you have to get to to start being able to talk about some of these things. These aren't armchair opinions. It's really, we, we delve really, really deep down into these subjects and then try and create falsifiable models and make decisions based on those sorts of things. So I think so, those are some of the differenti differentiators and one of the reasons I, th I thought this white paper was such an important piece of content to put out. I wanted to bring this up because I was very proud of this slide because I, I find it very funny because it shows how how deeply misunderstood even the term geopolitics is and how casually it's thrown thrown about. I especially like the geopolitics contributes to the 11% decline in air cargo demand. I'm, I'm not really sure what the heck that means. Um, but anyway, that was, that was my opportunity to throw that in. And, and just on the... Um, the point you were making, Jacob, with uh, with the difference between reading the newspaper and talking about politics and what you do is um, anyone can spout off opinions on politics. And, and let me just say personally, one of the things that I love about working with Jacob is he inspires me to read more books than I've ever read before. So we were doing this project on Turkey and I said to Jacob, you know, hey, my background knowledge in Turkey is not what I would like it to be, what would you recommend for me to really understand it the way that you do? And he recommended, you know, two books on Ataturk, one book on, you know, modern Turkish development, uh, novels by Orhan Pamuk, um, you know, this just broad range of uh, sort of humanist materials to, to really understand all of the elements at play, you know, these elements that are driving you know, the, uh, the constraints and imperatives of that situation. So that's a very scarce skill set. You don't see that, and you don't get those skills by getting, you know, a master's degree in economics from Oxford University or something. Um, it just doesn't exist. I, I don't, I know a lot of people in this business. I don't know very many, if at all, people who are like Jacob or know the strange melange of, of humanist subjects that he knows. Um, a quick, this is more of a practical question. How much is Jacob uh, and, and geopolitical analysis actually implicated in the stock managing choices? So this is a good one to, to riff on Jacob because it really depends. And I'm curious to hear your thoughts on it. But I think the way to answer that would be to say, it varies from very little to almost dominating the decision. And it completely depends on what the story is. So in the case of Sandstorm Gold, which you spoke about, the Hode Madden asset was their biggest asset. So everything was kind of hinging on, was this thing going to get confiscated? And if it did, it would be a disaster for them. And if it didn't, it would be a home run. And um, that's a very unique case where that was a sort of binary decision. Um, about a very specific asset located in a very specific place. Um, so that one is very much involved. Uh, another example I would point out is, you know, we're invested in Tencent and a large part of the Tencent analysis. So Tom, Tom Naughton is the analyst who uh, is the lead on Tencent. And Tom did all the bottom up work, you know, looking at the different segments of the business, how are they doing, how are they positioned, how are they growing, building a model, 
you know, all of the kind of real bottom up due diligence. But at the end of the day, in many ways, you know, we didn't view our advantage on Tencent relative to other investors. Like we didn't know those things necessarily better than anyone else. Tencent is a huge company. It's very well followed. I think where we saw an advantage was in the fact that Tencent was being sold down because of geopolitical issues, because people were afraid of Chinese regulation and of what Xi Jinping was going to do and that the communists were coming and they were going to squash all these companies. And our differentiated view in that case was Jacob's analysis that that did not appear to be what was happening. And having that differentiated geopolitical view tipped the scales as part of a broader analysis to making the decision to invest in Tencent. Um, so, you know, those are some specific examples. I don't know if you have anything you want to add on that, Jacob, but and if not, that's, that's fine. Just that, like, there's never going to be a decision that is only driven by geopolitics. Rob alluded to this. Geopolitics is about understanding power um, and about understanding the relationship between geography and political communities. That doesn't necessarily translate into an investment thesis. Sometimes it, it gives you the beginnings of an investment thesis, but the reason there's an investment team here at CI is to say, okay, we're going to take these ideas and we're going to figure out tactically what is the right moment to do them. And it's nice that the, there are these macro things that you like, but have you looked at the balance sheet of this company? This is not like it can be the best macro situation in the world, but like this balance sheet isn't going to fly. So like, like I said, I, I feel like I'm the compass on the team so I can give us direction. Sometimes all you need is direction. Like in the, in, in the, um, in the example of Sandstorm, like all you needed was what direction is this particular thing going to go and you don't really need any more. Um, but I also wasn't the one who found Sandstorm. For me, it was you bring in that tool at that particular point in time. If it's a country, then, you know, I am pointing in that direction. I'm able to sort of give us some things, but it's not, it's not just one human here. I mean, Rob and I are, are working together constantly and there's an entire team behind us as well. Um, so you're seeing us, we're talking about it. We sound really intelligent. We're also only as intelligent as the team that is behind us and all the guys that are doing research and sharpening our views from that point of view as well. We just, we can't put all of them on here because it would be too disorienting. They're um, working. So yeah, <laughs> they're, they're, they're working in the, in, in literally in the gold mines of Turkey and we're, we're here presenting and sounding really, really smart. So it's, it's really, it's a team. And, and one thing about me has always been, um, you always want to be on a team. You always want to be in an environment where people are challenging your views constantly. Because in my career, all the major mistakes I, I feel like I've ever encountered or made were when it was groupthink or when everybody was pulling in the same direction, you weren't pushing against each other. So in that sense, I really, it's really the team here and not just sort of a, oh, like the geopolitical thing points in the right direction. I would just, un I would just emphasize that. Um, and I think it goes both ways too, because Jacob is formulating theses about different countries and different areas. And the investment work that we do informs his thinking as well. So the Turkey example is the perfect one. So we were having this discussion here. It was Thanksgiving. This sell-off was happening. And Jacob was saying, well, I'm really worried about Turkey. And he, as he said, he gave us this presentation where he knocked our socks off with all the bad things that were happening in the short term and the lira and the interest rate policies, bananas, all of that stuff. And yet we said to him, that's not what, what the market action is telling us. Like the Turkish index is not even able to make a new low. It's not behaving in a way that's suggesting that things are dire. So what are other potential explanations? And then that caused Jacob to turn and look at other factors and longer term issues or, you know, um, see things in a different light. So it's a back and forth process in both directions. Um, and no one else is really doing that, that I understand. Um, I think most of the other firms that have any sort of macro or top down uh, exposure at all, never mind geopolitics, as I said, no one's really doing that. But the ones that do have it, are these huge institutions where everyone is so siloed. And I mean, trust me, we interact with these institutions all the time. You talk to the guy who covers auto stocks, he knows nothing about what the macro guy is doing or the economist guy or the politics guy. And the politics guy couldn't tell you anything about what's happening you know, with Ford Motor Company and, and their strategy and their margin structure and all that stuff. 
And that's how it's organized. It's a very, you know, industrial organization mindset where everyone has their little silo and they go in their box and it's much less than the sum of its parts because no one really interacts. There's no communication. Uh, whereas we have a boutique sized team, it's small enough to be manageable and everyone is coming from different places and is trading off of each other um, and helping each other. So it's a, it's a very different setup and that's how we've designed it on purpose. We're never gonna be that huge institution. We're always gonna be boutique sized, even you know if we're managing $10 billion in the future. So, um, Yeah, someone, anonymous attendee says, you know, we could sell our, our analysis to big uh, investment companies or institutional investors. Um, I think the, just to address that, um, I think our, our real primary purpose is to put it to work for individuals. And our goal here is not to just produce stuff to produce content for people to read. Our real goal is to work with individual people and help them grow their wealth over a long time period. And in the environment in which we find ourselves, this is the kind of work, this is the kind of in-depth research and knowledge of the world that you need to navigate that. Uh, and that's our, uh, our reason for being as a firm is this notion that you're going to go to your financial advisor and they're going to, you know, put you in a passive asset allocation strategy and just, you know, call it a day and you wake up 10 years later and your money is doubled or tripled. This, this is not going to happen anymore. So how do you navigate the choppy seas? Um, so that's really our, our priority. Uh, that said, for our clients and especially institutional clients, so as I said, if you're a financial advisor, if you're an institution who wants to work with us and have us uh, help you manage money using these tools, um, we bring both the individuals and the institutional clients onto our knowledge platform, which we're rolling out. As we speak, it's going to be out this summer, which is essentially a dashboard where you can access all of the work that we're doing, not just on geopolitics and these issues, but also bottom-up trends, pictures of, of uh, field work that we're doing, um, very deep industry level stuff and very high level geopolitical stuff all together, along with for individual investors, things like, you know, uh, how should I time the purchase of a house? Is this a good time to be buying a car? Um, using the same base of research to uh, provide information on those sorts of uh, consumer decisions, big ticket decisions that are, are very important for your everyday life. So. Uh, keep an eye out for that. That's going to be a big part of what we do. And, um, and that's more of a human wealth approach as opposed to actually managing money through something like CI strategic wealth. All right. Why don't we close it there? Unless you have any final thoughts, Jacob? No, this was fun. And I'm sure we'll be back soon with more. So. Okay. Thank you so much for coming. And if you would like to speak more or learn more about what we do and how you might work with us, please reach out to us and you can follow us at either of these channels here. So hope to see you soon and hope to talk to you soon. Take care.